Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, keep goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. create a model of what our current customers are. So I took a bunch of clients from one of our higher level programs, created a artificial, well, sorry, a machine learning text classifying model based on them. And now anytime somebody opts into our email newsletter, which is a couple thousand times a day, it runs them through this process and compares them to the model and can predict with 94% accuracy if a person will become a customer. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 301 with Ari Meisel. Ari is an entrepreneur, author, TED speaker, real estate developer, and productivity expert. A graduate of UPenn's Warden School of Business, he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease while building his property development business in 2007. Crohn's is an incurable disease of the digestive tract. Ari's case was severe and required over a dozen daily medications and several hospital visits. After reaching a personal low point in hospital, Ari decided he would do everything in his power to strengthen his, by then, weak body. Through a combination of yoga, nutrition, natural supplements, and rigorous exercise, he was able to fight back the symptoms of Crohn's until he was finally able to suspend his medication. Eventually, Ari was declared free of all traces of the incurable disease, quote unquote, and competed in Ironman France in June of 2011. Ari has since spoken at seminars and at regional TED Talks about his struggle against a seemingly insurmountable opponent. Through the process of data collection, self-tracking, and analysis, Ari helped develop less doing. This was a way of dealing with the daily stretches of life by optimizing, automating, and outsourcing all of his tasks in life and business. Expect to learn some transformational things in this episode, including one, why founders should make themselves replaceable, two, Iris Proprietary Productivity Framework, OAO, and three, one single word that can open you up to 10xing your productivity and giving you more time for life. With that, I bring you Ari Meisel. Welcome to the show, Ari. Uh, Thanks for having me, Steve. That's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, and you're joining me all the way from sunny Brooklyn, New York City. That's correct, and you're joining me all the way from Bali, is it? Bali? No, not quite. Melbourne, Australia. Although oh, well, I, I'm in Bali, I feel like these days. So sorry. I was I was in Bali a few months ago, so maybe you saw an Instagram photo or something of me in Absolutely. Bali. Hence the confusion. Yeah. But um, every time I think Brooklyn, growing up in Australia, I just immediately default to thinking the Beastie Boys and Notorious B.I.G. Yeah, uh, I, you know, we, I hear that a lot from people. Um, <laughs> it's, definitely, it's definitely different, I think, than it was now. We, we uh, for for better or worse, I think we live in like the poshest neighborhood in Brooklyn. Yeah, um, it, it, which it wasn't a couple of years ago, and it, it's rapidly changed. So yeah, re- Brooklyn's quite different. I grew yeah. up in New York my whole life. Yeah, is that? Are you in Williamsburg or nearby? I am in Dumbo. Dum- okay. Cool. Which How, stands for down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. Many people don't uh, know that even though they live in New York. Yes, yes. So I was over in Brooklyn recently, but I was, as you would expect from most uh, foreigners, particularly uh, millennials, I made my way over to Williamsburg. So that was a pretty uh, generic move on my part. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, Ari, look, I'm really excited to chat with you today because I think you've got an awesome story to unpack and also love the way you go about optimizing not only work, but also optimizing your life. And I think there's a lot of lessons in this conversation for our audience to take out. So, um, you know, you've said that when a business is first starting out, it ultimately needs a strong founder, someone in the trenches who isn't afraid to get their hands dirty. But 
as you discover the hard way, it needs a lot more than just the grit of its founder. And in your case, it ultimately landed you in hospital. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I mean, and I, I to, to be fair and just to be transparent to everybody, I was living a really unhealthy lifestyle. Stress mm-hmm. is a big part of it, but I wasn't taking particularly good care of my body. And I think that as sort of like a general thing too, entrepreneurs and business people don't treat their high, per, they should be high performers in general, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of them don't treat themselves like that. They don't treat themselves like athletes would. And we should, because a lot of people are. And if you want to be performing at a high level among other high performers, you have to do that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in particular and corporate executives tend to conflate success purely with success in terms of the monetary um, returns and how many zeros they have in the bank account and kind of look past the nutrition, the exercise, the taking care of one's mind as well, because you're going to take all of that stuff home and what's the point of having success uh, by way of zeros in your bank account if you're overweight if you're not really showing up for your family if every other aspect of your life just isn't where it needs to be well it's also i mean completely correct and but also you would never ever hear a pro athlete say something like oh yeah yeah i've been working 20 hour days this week really grinding it out <laughs> and turn my head down you know like you wouldn't you <laughs> that's absurd and i don't know why we see that as any different when we're trying to perform mentally Mm. at a high level. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And in your case, I mean, you said you weren't taking care of yourself. I mean, you were a one-man show trying to build your own uh, business. Uh, What ultimately happened? Well, so so that business was uh, a real estate development company. I'd gotten Mm -hmm. out of the uh at a school and i went to visit this friend in upstate new york i started this big real estate project and when i was 23 i was in three million dollars of personal debt i had been living a very unhealthy lifestyle as i said i've been i was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day i was drinking in most days i was probably acting in a reckless manner on a construction site for the most part because i was like a 21 year old kid with this all this stuff going on and Mm -hmm. I wasn't sleeping great. I just had just all of this stress of everything that was happening. And I broke my body and I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which I get also not to like concern people. You can't catch Crohn's disease. It doesn't, it's not something that happens that yeah. like yeah. Just from being unhealthy. Like there's a genetic predisposition to it. There's a whole bunch that goes into it. In retrospect, I've been having symptoms since I was mm-hmm. in my teens, but it never been recognized. And at 23, I was diagnosed. And once I was diagnosed, I hit a, it was a rapid decline. I was put on a lot of medicine. I got weaker and sicker and just hit a really low point where mm-hmm. I was finally able to turn things around in a very drastic way and overcome the illness. Now, a big part of that was the nutrition and the supplements and the fitness. But what I came to realize in fortunately fairly short order was that stress was a huge part of the illness. And my mm-hmm. response to that was to create a brand new system of productivity, which was just me trying to hack my time uh, present presented with the question of what would you do if you could only work an hour a day a lot of people would say that's impossible and some like myself would come up with a completely different way of thinking yeah and um definitely want to get into the system you've developed but just before we get there ari um with crohn's disease so basically that's an uncurable disease of the digestive tract or or should i say quote unquote uncurable disease at least that's what the doctors told you and i know that you were on something like 16 pills a day within two weeks of diagnosis um pills that basically turned you into a a raving lunatic you said um that kept you up all night throwing up uh, repeatedly for something like six months so for a lot of people in that position i mean some would just give up and just stop trying you know, you get told so many different things by doctors. You get told that it's, it's an incurable disease. You're throwing up every day, every night. You're waking up repeatedly. I mean, what kept you going? Well, uh, it, it's interesting. So my wife, Anna, who, now my wife, uh, mm-hmm. I met her a month before I was diagnosed. And we started dating right. very quickly. And so that was certainly something that I wanted to mm-hmm. be around for <laughs> and <laughs> and participate in. And also it was it was the beginning of what would be the start of me starting a family and all these things. So I, th- I think it was a major shift in my life that just happened to coincide at the time. Although at the same time, I feel like that was related to how I actually got diagnosed because I think that Anybody who's ever done any sort of long distance running or any really hardcore sports, your body can 
push for quite a long time, like way beyond what most people think they're capable of. But what I have found, at least in my life, is that when I start to slow down, when I finally take a break, that's when like you get sick or you get a cold or like other things happen because it's like your body's defenses come down because it's not trying to work anymore. And I, mm-hmm. I, I kind of feel like that's what happened. Like it just sort of coincided with me. I was settling down a little bit. I had finished the project at that point and it, it all just kind of hit all at once. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I guess something you touched on there, uh, the author, Alex Hutchinson, who wrote the book in Jewel, talks about how we can push our bodies way further than we think they're actually capable of. And, you know, a lot of marathon runners, when they hit the wall, they just keep going because they know they can keep going. But if you've never been in that position before, you're like, I've got to give up. I can't do this. My body's going to gonna give way and collapse. But we obviously can go much further than we think. But within the realm of entrepreneurship, a lot of people keep pushing themselves and pushing themselves. And like yourself, once those signs get to a point where you say, okay, I've got to listen to this little signal in my brain that's telling me to take a rest, oftentimes it could be too late. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a lot of us, you know, and when I say us, I mean entrepreneurs particularly, mm-hmm. who for better or worse, uh, and a lot of times worse, just don't have an off switch. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of that, I mean, how much of that do you think comes back to the fact that if you read TechCrunch, if you read Mashable, if you listen to guys like Gary Vaynerchuk, it's always about hustle, 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 grind, 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 work your 14-hour days. Uh, I mean, how much of that is just conflating success with this idea that I need to just work 14 to 16 hour days and move aside every other aspect of my life. Well, so the, I, I don't like that. And I really, it bothers mm-hmm. me when I see that from a, a lot of entrepreneurs who just think that by doing it, like doing it more than the other people or doing it harder than other people, they're, they're going to get there. There are absolutely yeah. situations in our life where the one who works the hardest wins that, 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 mm-hmm. that exists and that will always exist in our lives. But with entrepreneurship, that's not the case. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do that are really about working smarter and not harder. And while that may sound like a cliche, a lot of people don't live that. They think that they have to wear, you know, quote unquote, wear all the hats. There's so many expressions. They have to wear all the hats. They have to go heads down. They have to, you know, hustle with their side hustle and all that kind of stuff. And the problem is that hustle is great. Uh, if it's intermittent, mm-hmm. right? Because you can't hustle forever. And you people get into this pattern when they're growing their businesses and they become victims of their own success. And we see this over and over and over again. And it's it's fascinating from my point of view because I get to see so many different businesses that I get to work with. From a hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollars in revenue, the focus for pretty much every company at that point. The focus has to be on sales and leveraging sales, basically as automating sales as much as you can. So that's the point where people they're grinding. They've hit a, they've hit six figures. Like they're starting to you know they they know this is a real thing, and they start to grind, grind, and grind, and they want to make sales. They're doing sales calls. They're prospecting. They're doing networking. The problem is that the three hundred thousand to a million mark is that sweet spot where you have to be putting systems and processes in place that replace what you do well. And if you can't do that, you do not get past a million dollars. It just doesn't happen. We've seen it time and time again. You have companies that just hit a wall at 700,000, 800,000. And that, not that that's not a respectable number, but mm. they, they get stuck in this pattern where they have pretty much put themselves into like a pigeonhole and they're just piling more work on the money's coming in, but they're the only ones that can actually service the business. Yeah. And, and not only that, not only is there a ceiling, but in order to keep that business ticking over, they need to continuously do what they've been doing up until that point because they haven't spent the time working out what their processes are, um, codifying things, automating, outsourcing. I mean, they can bring that back somewhat, but if they've built up this business around themselves and if they stop working, a lot of people find it difficult to make that transition because they think the whole business is just going to collapse if I re- remove myself from this business that's now making, say, $3 million. Exactly. And so the whole thing that I do now is I empower entrepreneurs to become more replaceable. And the mm-hmm. people listening to this who find that really exciting, then you should keep listening. And if you're scared of the idea of being yeah. replaced, then you're listening to the wrong show probably. <laughs> and that, that's uh, interesting. I mean, a replaceable founder, the It sounds like an oxymoron, or at least it sounds somewhat counterintuitive. Yeah, and it should, because most productivity tips and tools out there are complete BS. Mm -hmm. And the the thing is, is that I don't want to actually replace people. I don't want to remove you from what you love doing. I want to 
seek replaceability because if you're not replaceable, you are a liability in your company. Nothing more. And, and that's a, a fact. Uh, if you seek replaceability, then that means that your company can scale beyond you. And if you're a true entrepreneur, then the success of the idea is what actually matters. And it's the reason why you see people who are serial entrepreneurs, of which I am one, who can move from one company to the next, to the next, to the next. And it doesn't matter how much work they put into it, what the payday was, how much they lost. None of that matters mm -hmm. because the idea is what matters. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. And I guess um, it uh, aligns with something that Jim Collins spoke about when I think it was in Built to Last, where he said a lot of great companies have one leader at the top, but that one leader doesn't create the systems, the processes, doesn't empower other people to basically keep that business going long after they have left the organization. And you've seen so many great companies uh, basically collapse within several years of a fundamentally um, transformational leader leaving the helm. Um, so you're basically not building an idea that can run on its own. You're building something that can effectively amplify one's ego in many ways. And, and I guess today, something you touched on is the fact that people conflate, um, or people see working long hours, being busy, not sleeping, basically as a badge of honor. Uh, but the badge of honor should be getting stuff done in say four to five hours a day and having the rest of that time available to go out, spend time with your family, with your friends, go explore something else, take up a hobby, go traveling, do whatever you can do. I mean, to me, that seems like a much more suitable version, or at least in my mind, that's way more, that's something that I would be proud of rather than working 16 hour days and being stressed and disheveled all the time. And when I get home to my family, I'm just not wanting to have a conversation with them. Yeah, I mean, the, the badge of honor for me is that I get to do something that I love every single day. I have a massive impact mm -hmm. on people's lives that I work with, and I'm not disappointing anybody in my life. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love that. And in that case, I mean, you're working something like, was it five hours a day on average? Yeah, so I, I typically work while the kids are at school. So that's basically 9 to 2.30 most days. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Some people listening to this might think, well, how on earth do you get anything done in just, you know, from nine to two thirty? Uh, I guess I would love to explore what are some of the systems or processes that you've put into place, uh, particularly around this uh, proprietary system you've developed. Yeah, well, I'll start by saying that, and I don't mean this in a, like a bragging way, but nine nine to two thirty is generous. That's a that's that's warm enough <laughs> for me to have lunch and do things that I want. So, love it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I I can be as productive as I need to be with pretty much any amount of time I'm given to do it. So the whole system that I created, uh, which originally, well, so the company's called Less Doing, but the original technology mm -hmm. was really focused on personal productivity. And the whole idea was to help people optimize, automate, and outsource everything in their lives so that they could be more effective. And that order is crucially important. And it has morphed into more of a business methodology at this point, but it's still based on that idea. Most people, when they outsource, they have a bad experience. And a lot of that times, a lot of times it's because they've outsourced first. They use outsourcing as a first line of defense. And it's a very common sort of human thing where it's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do this thing. I don't like doing this thing. I'm not good at this thing. I'm going to get somebody else to do this thing. But to think like, I'm going to take this thing that I don't quite understand, I'm not great at, and I'm annoyed by it, and I'm going to hand it to somebody else and expect this ma magical result. And they have less information, less context, less training, less mm -hmm. desire, honestly. And I'm going to get this super, super result. It doesn't happen. And everybody's disappointed. So we really have to start with the optimize first. And that is the biggest component of what I teach people is you have to look at how you do the things you do now. And while that sounds stupidly simple, the vast majority of people don't do it. You know, if I asked you the things that you do on a daily basis that are repetitive, mm -hmm. it, 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 even me, I mean, and I'm, I'm very aware of this stuff, but it's a difficult thing to answer uh, because we're just, there's too much stuff going on. And as we said in the beginning of the episode here, that the human body will keep going, the human mind will keep going. What happens is we have a very limited capacity to deal with the things that we deal with on mm -hmm. a daily basis. And people don't realize that. Like you have about 22 good decisions in you on a given day. And most of us make those yeah. before we walk out of our bedroom in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then you have a thousand other decisions that come throughout, throughout the day that are, are just unnatural for us. We have not evolved bio uh, biologically as quickly as we have technologically. So the thing is, is that the human brain is fascinating because we'll get to a point where it's had enough, it's overwhelmed, 
but it'll keep going, right? So we'll keep doing all the calls. We'll keep grinding through the night. We'll keep, uh, you know, sitting through the meetings. Like we'll just keep going and let the tide wash over us. And in those situations, particularly, nobody stops to say, why am I doing it this way? How am I actually doing it? What are the steps yeah. required to do this? Does it have to be done by me? And then you get into a whole psychological thing about people feeling like their value and their worth comes from doing the maneuver yeah. that makes them look busy, as we sort of alluded to before. So it's just this vicious cycle. Yeah. And if you take anybody in any job, in any position, founder, uh, gender, salesperson, anything, and you just have them stop and ask them, you know, why do you do this this way? Why are you paying bills that way? Why do you do social media in that form format? Um, why, why do you write articles every other Wednesday? Why, why do you do? This? A lot of times you get the answer that is, well, but that's how we've always been doing it. That's how we've done it for six months, mm-hmm. which is a terrible reason to keep doing it. Mm. So if you stop, it, yeah. why are we doing this? How are we using our resources? Tracking, identifying. There's inherent inefficiencies in everything that we do that you can eliminate in minutes. Yeah, and I think there's a hell of a lot of inertia, particularly amongst uh, executives at large organizations who tend to just default to having one-hour meetings. Oftentimes, when a quick phone call or a or an you know Slack message or an email will do the job. Uh, constantly checking email. And I know this is something that you've talked about with Inbox Zero, and I'm keen to unpack that as well. But um, we'll get there shortly. But on the optimization piece, obviously, you know, Peter Drucker, I think it was, who said that productivity is what you don't do. I think he also said something along the lines of, um, there's nothing worse than the wrong things done right. And it seems to me that that's what happens all the time, um, particularly in corporate America, where we focus on efficiency and making sure everything's done just right, but we're focusing on the wrong things. So bringing it back to the optimized piece, I guess it's really about people asking the question, why am I doing this? And is this going to create value? Um, is this something that aligns with my strengths? Are these the kinds of questions that people should be asking when it comes to optimize? Yes, exactly. Uh, and there, there's an, and so the second part is automate, which I'll get to in a moment, but a lot of mm-hmm. people are afraid to ask those questions sometimes, or they're just like, oh, I'm just too busy. I'm too busy to you know, take the time to identify the processes in my business. And to me, that's like saying you're too busy to sleep. Like it's just, it, it's, it's insane mm-hmm. to me that you would just keep grinding and just keep going through it. Because again, what, you know, what happens if you get sick? What happens if you get hit by a bus? Like it's just game over. Uh, because not only do you not know how people or how the things get done in your business, but a lot of other people in your business don't know either. So they end up Mm -hmm. going through the motions, completely lacking any form of empowerment, which is how you end up managing people instead of leading them. And Mm. you see it all the time. It's terrible. And it's, it's, it's not that difficult of a fix either. No, it's not. And I actually caught up for a coffee with a fellow business owner and he's got this technology platform and he sells it to uh, energy bodies and utility organizations and things of that persuasion. And, um, I basically told him that I automate and outsource a lot of what I do. And he shot back with, oh, but you had to spend time setting all that stuff up, didn't you? And I just laughed because I thought, yeah, I did. But now I don't have to do any of that stuff. And I'm free to focus on the areas that align with my strengths. And I'm able to leave the office some days at you know 3 p.m. In fact, most days without sacrificing or compromising the, the growth or or the success of the business. But some people just don't want to spend that time up front. They would rather just get um, busy being busy and, you know, satisfy some of their underlying ego issues, I guess. Um, And ultimately just keep playing that game and just be like the hamster on the wheel rather than reflecting on it, like you said, and taking the time to reflect on how do I spend my time? Um, Are these things worth spending my time on? And if they are, which of them can I outsource and which of them can I automate? And part of it is just asking yourself, like, is there a better way? <laughs> you know? um, mm. Sometimes yeah. it's that simple. And a lot of people don't, they, they don't want to take the time to do that. Uh, you know, a good example of that is when you ask somebody, like, why don't you outsource this thing? Or why don't you tell me? Or just ask them, like, why don't you not do this, basically? And somebody like, I don't know, it'll just take a minute. It'll take me longer to explain it to somebody than to do it myself. It's like, okay, fine. You say it'll only take a minute, and maybe it will. But the difference between how long it takes to do something versus how long it takes to get it done could be enormous. Because if it mm-hmm. takes you a week to get to that thing that takes you a minute, then how long did it really take? 
Yeah, exactly. And and also on things that just take a minute, uh, it could be, I just want to take a minute to send this email and then you'll jump into your inbox and you'll see 15 other emails that have arrived since the last time you checked it and you might click on one of them or maybe two of them. You'll respond to those emails and then 30 minutes later, you're questioning, hmm, what was I doing? Oh, oh yeah, I was going to send that email off. Yeah, yeah. and that, there's a cognitive yeah. switching cost when multitasking is not something that actually exists. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it doesn't work, but then yeah. the second thing though, is to automate. So uh, it, it's been, it's interesting because again, it is optimized, automated outsource outsourcing is the last step. I outsource thousands of things on a regular basis, but I'm also always trying to avoid outsourcing and I'm still outsourcing thousands of things. But as soon as we get a person involved, we're opening ourselves up to error and lack of engagement. And those two things all make it a lot mm-hmm. less efficient. Automation is my playground. And we can automate things now that two weeks ago a person had to do that you would have to hire. And it's fascinating. Everything from machine learning to artificial intelligence to just simple repetitive tasks that are triggered by something and then action has to take place. So if you find yourself going through the motions of the day and you say every, that's an opportunity for automation. So if you say every time a customer signs up, we do this. Every time we send out a tweet, every time we send Mm -hmm. an invoice, any of the everys, there's an opportunity for automation. So we start to think about some very basic things like triggers and actions, like I said. So every time a customer signs up, we want to send them a welcome email. Okay, great. Most mail services can do that very quickly and inherently, and a lot of people are familiar with that. But it's amazing to me how many people don't use a tool like Buffer to simultaneously post on all their social media platforms, and they do that manually, especially when Mm -hmm. they don't know really how to do like a social media strategy. Um, And then we get into things that are very complex. Like I created an automation for a a number of people in one of our programs that they can do a a quick Facebook live on their Facebook pages, you know, like a a one minute Facebook live about something. And that will Mm -hmm. automatically turn into a podcast, a YouTube video, a social media post video, 12 months of social media posts and a blog (laughs) post for medium and all that stuff happens manually. So two things happen there. One is people need to get content out and that's great. And they can get it everywhere very quickly. And anybody anywhere can consume it in the way that they want. But two, nobody can ever tell me that they don't have time to create content. Now, Mm -hmm. the most complex one currently that I've done is I use the machine learning tool to create a model of what our current customers are. So I took a bunch of clients from one of our higher level programs, created a artificial, well, sorry, a machine learning text classifying model based on them. And now anytime somebody opts into our email newsletter, which is a couple thousand times a day, it runs them through this process and compares them to the model and can can predict with 94% accuracy if a person will become a customer. Wow. Now that's, that's next level. Man. Yeah. And the thing is, that's the kind of thing that you would literally hire a prospecting company and a sales team and all sorts of stuff for. And I built this tool in a half an hour and quintuple our sales in two months. Mm. Is there a risk with that tool that you might be, say, basing that decision on past performance and therefore new prospective customers might get, um, basically flagged by the system as not being likely to purchase or how have you dealt with that? So it's a very, very good point. And so what I do is I create self improving models. So basically anytime Mm -hmm. somebody becomes a customer, whether they opt in the mailing list or not, it doesn't matter. And they hit our Stripe account, the Stripe purchase automatically triggers to go back to the model and add training to it and say like, this was a good one. So whether it predicted it or not, or it didn't see this person before, it continues to say like, this is what a customer looks like. And this is what a customer looks like. Mm -hmm. So it gets better and better. Yeah. And that's, that's a great point because so many entrepreneurs will waste their time, particularly B2B entrepreneurs, uh, going to meeting after meeting and literally more often than not, it's one hour long meetings with say a corporate prospect who has expressed some remote um, interest in their product. And they might be doing this you know, for 20 hours a week, maybe more. And of those meetings, maybe one in 20, if that, if they're lucky, is legitimately interested in purchasing their product, has the budget, has the appetite, it's the right time, they're not working with anyone else, all those variables are aligned. But with something like this, obviously they're saving themselves potentially 
um, in some cases, 10 to 20 hours a week on meetings that they would otherwise attend because the system says, hey, these guys are probably unlikely to buy. I mean, they're a 5% chance. So if anything, maybe send them an email, maybe have a five minute conversation to qualify them a little more, but don't spend too much time on them. Right, exactly. And sometimes just setting limits is a great way to create innovative ways to be more productive. Yeah, exactly. And I think something that a lot of people can do, which is way easier, is just, you know, set uh, a five minute phone call. It's something that I've done for initial um, exploratory conversations with prospects who've, say, landed on, uh, who've basically come through as a lead. Uh, Rather than defaulting to a 30 minute meeting or a one hour meeting, just have a five minute conversation and ask, targeted questions to determine whether or not they're a chance of being a, product, a, a client. And if they are, then maybe you want to bump it up to 30 minutes, but don't go defaulting to 30 to 60 minutes for every single lead that comes yeah, through. And so, yeah. so that comes in, into another thing that, that has been really good for me, which is <laughs> uh, asynchronous communication. So right, like the opposite of what we're mm-hmm. doing right now. Um, but there is a, do you know the app Voxer? Yeah. Okay, so for those who don't, Voxer is basically like a, a, an asynchronous walkie-talkie app. So you can send voice messages back and forth. Not, not just somewhere to WhatsApp, mm-hmm. but it's way, way better. So when I started doing coaching uh, eight years ago, people would get two one-hour in-person meetings every month as part of their coaching. And what that quickly, what I quickly realized was that that meant that my limit for coaching was probably about 12 clients. Mm-hmm. which was great at the time. Um, but now I have a coaching program with 50 people in it and they get unlimited Voxer access to me. So what that means is that I have clients all over the world who message me every single day, some, some of them. And instead of having 45 minute conversations with people to give them the three minute answer that they need, I'm having 30 second exchanges every single day with a lot of different people and giving answers and moving the needle a lot faster for them and creating course corrections. And it's been uh, remarkable to see that. And it's the kind of thing where most people would say like, oh my gosh, you know, the people are paying so much for your your service a month. Like they expect to be able to get on the phone with you. It's like, no, they they don't actually, because this works better for them too. Yeah. Well, it creates the value and it's convenient for them. And I guess in that case, all you had to do was basically keep stock of what are the frequently asked questions that I get um, in my role. And then spend the time to record that and then Voxer will basically do the rest. Yeah. Fantastic. Love it, man. Um, so earlier on in our conversation, I did mention Inbox Zero. And in my view, Inbox Zero is something that I've always thought was a signal that you're really good at responding to other people's demands on your time because you're just in there all the time. You're constantly replying to emails. And if you get to Inbox Zero, hey, you've done everyone else's work, but you haven't done your own. I mean, what are your views on Inbox Zero? Because I know they're slightly different. So... I actually, and there was a big discussion in one of our Facebook groups about this today, and it got kind of heated. It's kind of funny. I feel, I feel very strongly mm-hmm. about this. So I think that, first of all, I think email in itself is one of the greatest productivity tools ever created. And people who mm-hmm. don't think that are not using it correctly. And I can, I can explain more about that. The yep. big thing about email and about Inbox Zero is that the email problem is not an email problem. It's a decision-making problem. And you have it. Not you particularly, but you know you and Joe. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> as I said before, we only we only have a certain amount of good decisions in us in a given day. And the email inbox, if you think about it, is a very unique and unusual uh, scenario where we're presented with the opportunity to make thousands of decisions in a given day. You don't see that anywhere else. Um, and the biggest thing is that a lot of people see every email as a new decision, wh- whether they realize it or not. They get it, it's exhausting. It's just, it's absolutely exhausting. Mm. And what you have to realize is that there's really only three ways to handle any email. And what you eventually realize is that there's only three ways to handle most decisions in uh, in a given moment. So the three Ds is my method. So you can delete it, Mm -hmm. you can deal with it, or you can defer it. And that's it. So there's also a whole thing about how to deal with a whole big backlog of email, but that's that's a, a sort of a separate point. So any email that comes in, you have those three choices. So think about that, right? The first one is to delete it. So you're going to say no. And if you, again, if you think about this in terms of decisions in general, we need to be better at saying no. I think most people are aware of that, but they have 
something called acrasia, which is a worse form of procrastination, basically, where we know we should be doing something, but we're not doing anything about it. Um, procrastination is actually a step beyond, uh, a step above, uh, improved beyond that because with procrastination, we, yeah. we've made the decision to do something, we're just not doing it. So acrasia is really bad. And that's what ends up happening in most of these cases is that we know we should be saying no to more things, but we just don't do it. So, yeah. With, uh, so you have a choice, you can delete, delete it. And you say no. There's a lot of different ways to say no, but delete it. And not only do you delete it if it's not relevant or not important, but roughly 40% of the emails that people respond to don't actually require a response. We think that we're doing people a favor by writing back and saying, K, okay, got it. Yep. Thanks. You know? <laughs> Hmm. It, it, it it's there's a boomerang effect to email the more email that we send the more email we get so don't do that if somebody's just informing you then be informed and continue on with your life now the second one is to deal with it so if you can deal with something right now you got to deal with it right now because it goes back to the thing i said before that you might say oh yeah i'll just come back to this later it'll just take me a minute but that minute will never be there there will always be something else in that time hmm. and the truth is is that no matter how small of an accomplishment Every little thing that we get done feels good. And we get a little dopamine hit from that. And it's motivating. So do it right now. Now, mm -hmm. doing it right now could include delegating it. Because if you delegate effectively to somebody who knows what they're doing, then in that moment, you really are done. There's really nothing else that you can do. The third one is the most interesting. So if you can't say no, and you can't do it now, then you have to do it another time. And that's not procrastination. That is deferring. Deferring is where you're taking an active decision to say there is a better time and maybe a better place where I can do this particular kind of thing. And that's the next time I ever want to hear about this particular thing. So for example, if somebody were to email me at nine in the morning and say like, Ari, we really need you to write this article on this thing. I know from lots and lots of experimentation and testing that I can only do creative work after eight o'clock at night. And I think it has to do with it, it's calmed down in my house. We tend to be a little more creative, more time, but I know mm -hmm. that about myself. So I will defer that email to eight o'clock at night. And then I will forget about it until that time. And what you start to learn about yourself is there really truly are better times and places to do different kinds of things. And if you can mold your work day and your work week around that to whatever extent you're able, you'll see a massive boost in your productivity. And the whole thing about that is that we have yeah. something in our biology called peak time or prime time, or depends on which research you mm -hmm. look at. But there's a 90 minute period in the day for each one of us that is different, where you are two to 100 times more effective than any other time of the day. And that's not hyperbole. That's a real, real thing. And if you protect that time and use that time for your highest and best purpose, you'll be astounded at how productive you can be. Yeah, I think it's about being uh, quite emotionally uh, self-aware as well and also just self-aware of how you work when you do your best work and creating time to do that work. For example, if you're your best between, say, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. in terms of pumping out, say, an article or some sort of creative work, the last thing you want to be doing is scheduling meetings in that time or leaving yourself open to, say, disruptions and having notifications pop up on your desktop, on your phone, because that's just going to take you out of, say, flow, for example, and you might suffer the cognitive switching penalty. And before you know it, you've wasted half of the, your best two hours of the day. That's right. So I guess on all of these things, because there's a lot of good stuff that you've packed into this conversation, Ari, I know you've got a couple of books. Um, well, you've got a few books, uh, the five that I count, if not more on Amazon, but the most relevant would perhaps be The Art of Less Doing and The Replaceable Founder. Is that where people can learn more about these tools and techniques? Absolutely. Yeah. So The Art of Less Doing is more on the personal side of things and The Replaceable Founder is mm -hmm. more on the business side. Fantastic. Well, we'll link that up in the show notes for our listeners. Just before we wrap up, I wanted to throw you into our three question lightning round. And I don't know how you're going to respond to these questions given what we've been discussing. But the question, the first question is all about if you had to work for another organization, who would it be and at what stage of the company life cycle? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. So if I had to work for another organization, um, McDonald's. McDonald's. Well, when, when they were just starting out, when um, uh, Ray Kroc was joining. When they were just starting out. I think, um, as we've seen, Ray Kroc was kind of a monster, honestly, but he was also a, 
call also a visionary in terms of, <laughs> uh, in terms of, well, actually, I guess the McDonald brothers too, in terms of efficiency itself, right? The efficiency of movement and of laying it out. If, mm-hmm. if anyone's seen the movie, the, the founder, there's a scene where they're laying out the initial real like fast food version of McDonald's and they're drawing it in chalk on a tennis court. And it's like, it was one of the most incredible things I think Mm. I've ever seen, honestly. So I feel like that would have been really fascinating to see that because for whatever, I mean, whatever people might think of McDonald's and the, the obviously unhealthy food that they serve and everything in terms of business efficiency and operations and growth, there's, they're pretty much unmatched. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that aligns well with what we've been talking about today, Ari. I mean, just in terms of taking the time to systematize what you actually do. And in McDonald's case, it just gave them this massive competitive advantage over their competitors. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So question number two is, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, and maybe it's Ray Kroc, who would it be and what would you ask? It would definitely would not be Ray Kroc. It would be Harry Houdini. <laughs> Harry Houdini. Uh huh. What would you ask? <laughs> so, I would. Um, it's this is very esoteric. I have to admit this, but I, so I wanted to be a magician when I was younger, or not that I wanted. Yeah. It was something that I was I was passionate about when I was very young. And yeah. Harry Houdini has been a role model uh, for me, for a hero for a very long time, because not only was he an amazing magician, that every single magician ever since then has some sort of homage to, but. Uh, he was an incredible entrepreneur and started something really new that was very avant-garde. So uh, my question to him would be, how did he decide how long to hide and hold his breath for, basically? Because his very mm-hmm. one of his, a couple of his very famous uh, escape feats, he would give the illusion that he was trapped in water for three, four, five minutes. And people, everyone just thought he was dead. And 30 seconds would go by and it would just be worse and worse and worse. And then he would pop out from behind the curtain. So, uh, and it was, I mean, <laughs> people were fainting like it was crazy for that time. So I'd love to know how he decided that, how much he felt that he could push that limit without it becoming like too much for people. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great answer. And maybe it was a matter of incrementally pushing it a little bit further each time saying, oh, I think I had a few more seconds in me. Who knows? Um, and lucky last. Now, this is something that you're very close to. This is around optimizing your daily performance, uh, whether it's sleep, exercise, nutrition, biohacking. I mean, what are some of the key things you do on a daily basis to stay on top of your game, aside from outsourcing, automating, and optimizing your tasks? Um, so... Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, aside from that, that I mean, because there's definitely a lot of that. In, in <laughs> um, so I have I have four children, as as we've mentioned, mm-hmm. and w- th- at this point, they're they're pretty good sleepers, but things are kind of inconsistent in the morning. So one of the things that I'm I, I love to talk about is that I don't have a morning routine. You know, all these incredibly successful people in the world have a morning routine, but that is not what yep. makes them successful. So uh, it helps. It certainly helps. And I would love to have one if I could, but I can't. So uh, it just doesn't work out for me that way. So I do have a bit of a night routine. And I think that uh, it really sets me up for success and also really alleviates any chance of stress. And a big part of that is brain dumping. Um, so a lot of times at the end of the night, I will dump a whole bunch of ideas into Trello and I will sort Mm -hmm. those ideas to maybe assign those to a VA or to uh, one of the people on my team. But I I realize we're getting a little bit too close to optimizing automated outsourcing. But it really is that idea of brain dumping. And you can do it with a journal, uh, with handwriting or on your phone. It doesn't really matter. But I think that a lot of people go to sleep with far too many things on their mind. And the truth is is that our brain is a really bad place to hold ideas. It's a great place to come up with them, but it's a bad place to hold them. So that's one thing that's absolutely key for me is to Mm -hmm. have that brain dumping. And then on the true like biohacking side of things, I guess to some extent, I have a a pretty good mix of supplements that I've settled on that are really, really key for me and really my baseline. Yeah, Were there any supplements that were were transformational for you or were they more or less a case of just giving you that 2% edge here and there? Well, so when I was actively sick with Crohn's, there were three or four that were really key uh, in the, mm-hmm. that time, but that's not really, you know, that's not necessarily relevant to everybody. So at this point in my sort of just daily life as a dad and a husband and an entrepreneur, 
there's uh, there's several that are really key. So one is actually apple cider vinegar in supplement form. Um, so a lot of people right. are familiar with apple cider vinegar, like gargle it or you have tea or whatever, and it's really great for your immune system. Uh, I find that it, uh, in pill form, it works great for the immune system and also for digestion, which is obviously key. I also take a cinnamon supplement to help manage blood sugar, which really, really helps mm-hmm. with their goals. Because without that, I, send, I tend to see a big crash in energy around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. With it, I don't. So that's a big one too. And then uh, uh, then the other ones are pretty basic, probiotics, krill oil, and things like that. But it, for the most part, that mix uh, seems to serve me really, really well. Fantastic. And any particular brands or manufacturers worth mentioning there? Um, the, the probiotic that I like the best is called prescript assist. And that one is key. Mm-hmm. A lot of them to be on like krill oil, it doesn't really matter because pretty much there's like, I think there's only one company in the world that's allowed to harvest krill oil and then they resell it to everybody else. So that right. to me, like that's pretty much they're all the same. Uh, same thing with like a vitamin D supplement. There are obviously some ones out there that are not great, but for the most part, those things are good. Uh, but the probiotic really does make a difference. I, I notice a big difference. And Prescript Assist is the best one I've ever used. Fantastic. Well, we'll link that up in the show notes. So if people want to find out more about yourself, they can do so over at lessdoing.com, where they'll learn about all the awesome work you're doing to help people optimize their own lives. Um, they can hit you up on Twitter at Ari Maisel, and they can find your books on Amazon. Um, with that, thank you so much for your time, Ari. You've been an awesome guest, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Well, thank you very much for having me. Hi guys, Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gleveski and on Instagram at TheSteveGleveski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.